I'm a scientist. A pleasure of being a scientist is being in touch with nature every day and being able to reveal how nature works step by step, just like working on a huge jigsaw puzzle. Although each scientist's work is rather limited to the small fragment of nature, we are driven by curiosity and pursue the moment of new scientific discovery. Imagine the moment. Only I in this world, if not in the universe, know the certain truth in nature. Of course, that moment should not last very long because I should be reporting to the, this to the rest of the world so that other scientists can work or perform research further based on my finding. So first, let me show you some exciting examples of basic research going on at Keio University. The first example is that of Professor Oka, physics department, and he's an astrophysicist. Here I show you the visible picture of our galaxy, Milky Way. It is known that there are many radio sources, basically radio stations, distribu distributed among those galaxies. So I show you the distribution of radio stations. Only by going to this picture, scientists noticed interesting structure shown by the red circle. So let's magnify this part. This still radio picture, and also now I show you the visible picture. Okay, scientists from US, Germany, and Chile investigated the movement of stars in this galaxy for 16 years, and then they actually found that stars rotate around the core center slowly but surely, elliptical, we call it Kepler motions. And they found that the center core has the mass of four million times the mass of sun. That is a huge mass, four million suns, and that is considered to be a black hole. Furthermore, they found that gas cloud of about three suns are heading towards this black hole. And this is expected to happen March next year. And this is the first time human being can witness in live something crashing into black hole. And many scientists, including Professor Oka, is preparing for this magical moment. No one knows what's going to happen. Maybe huge explosion? We don't know. But surely there will be many discoveries. Next example. That is by, done by uh, Professor Maino. Have you wondered why fingerprints exist? To increase the friction so that you have better grip of it, less slipliness? or for your personal identification. <laughs> it wasn't known until very recently that he found out the following. So I'm going to explain his finding using this drawing that I'm very proud of. I haven't used crayon for many years, but finally I try. So here I show you the, on the right hand side, I show cross section of the finger surface. The ripples are fingerprints. And blue and green dots are sensors, OK? When you touch something, ripples are deformed. And the ripples are designed in such way that force propagates and focused at the blue dots. So basically, all the forces are focusing on the blue dots. And in sequence, they would actually propagate to the green dots. That was Professor Maino's hypothesis. Then he collaborated with medical school, KO medical school doctors, to measure precisely the elastic modulus, which is the, basically the softness or hardness of the fingers. And then using those parameters, numbers, he was able to generate this computer simulation with which he actually proved scientifically that fingerprints are there to increase the sensitivity of touch. So you feel better. You, you can feel better when you're touching something. This was a big discovery as far as I'm concerned. 
Next example. I'm going to show a total of four examples. Of course, that is done by <laughs> chair of this TED event, Professor Ushiba. He's our superstar. He's already explained his research in TEDx Tokyo last year or whatever. So if you haven't seen it, I, I encourage you to look at it. In short, what he developed is this headphone type of cool sensor to pick up your brain signal. This headphone reminds me of the first Walkman. It's very cool. <laughs> and this sensor picks up the brain signal, in this case, ordering your, his arms to do something. But in this case, the signal is going through the external wire to the machine, so the machine is doing what his brain was ordering to do. It's, imagine, it, it's, it's really amazing that machine can actually pick up your brain signal specifically to, to order machine to do something. This was already amazing enough for me. But what was even more interesting was that he found out that, or he and his colleague, I should say, that those who are suffering, basically who became disabled, as a, as, a, as a result of stroke or you know, other causes. By using such machine, not only they can move their arms, but also they can restore the transmission lines in the body. So the machine actually heals or recover the human ability to move your arms or his arms without relying to the machine. So this was a big discovery, at least uh, from my point of view. The last example is of my own, OK? <laughs> Unfortunately, this is the most difficult one to explain. <laughs> I'm a quantum physicist, and I'm working on studying quantum properties of matter to realize what it is called quantum computers. So let me show you how quantum world is different from real world. On the right hand side, I show compass, bar magnets. And normally, basically, compass points north. But I can also put uh, force, or I can use my fingers to turn the compass southwards. So let's say compass can have two directions. And I assign number 0, or 1, and 0 respectively. Zero and one are binary numbers we use in computation. We only use zero and one in computing. Left hand side shows the compass being sideways. If it's sideways, you might think this is 0 0.5, but zero, only zero and one are allowed. So normally, computer says this is error. But in our case, in quantum case, quantum magnet case, this is 0 and 1 at the same time. What is it good for? Now I have three quantum magnets placed sideways. And in this case, they are simultaneously 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1, seven different numbers. And in the decimal case, it's 0 to 7. So this quantum magnets, these quantum magnets can have many numbers simultaneously. If I can prepare 200 quantum magnets, the number I can prepare is 0 to 0, 0 to 10 to the 60. And that kind of number is the same number as the number of atoms in the universe. If you ever experience computer programming, there are many occasions that you have to use a loop. loop in which you say, OK, let's try one first, and then you perform calculation. Let's try two then, and three then, four then, up to large number. This process takes long time. But if you can prepare all these numbers simultaneously and perform calculation using those quantum magnets, basically, you can perform all calculation instantly. So this is actually super parallel computing and expect it for to, be, uh, to, to perform something impossible in a classical means. Okay. We discover that we can use magnetic silicon atoms 
embedded in non-magnetic silicon atoms as quantum magnets. Now this is becoming more difficult, but I just wanted to show the picture on right-hand side where in our lab we see each silicon atom, each dot, and the picture is each silicon atom, and between white arrows we were placing magnetic silicon atoms as a straight line. Imagine we can actually see atoms, we can place atoms, and we can play around with it. Okay. More recently, we're working with a group of scientists from Australia together, and they actually are using our special sample to create silicon quantum computer, which appears, wh whose appearance is almost like today's silicon quantum com silicon computer you have in your laptop or even in your refrigerator. So, we're having fun with quantum magnets, and we're exploring the quantum worlds. Probably, many of you have seen the famous TED talk by Sir Ken Robinson, entitled, Schools Kill Creativity. So let me quote what he said in there. Every educational system on Earth has the same hierarchy of subjects. At the top are mathematics and languages and humanities and bottom are arts. He also stated that we don't grow into creativity, but to grow out of it, or rather, we get educated out of it. Oh, by the way, this is our Christmas card this year. <laughs> so, recent worldwide benchmark exams performed on science and math on 14-year-old students reveal that Singapore, Finland, Hungary, UK, USA are in top 10. Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan are also in top 10. However, the percentage of students who wish to become scientists in Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan are lower than other top 10 countries. And that is probably because students in these countries study uh, science, not necessarily because they like nature, but they are basically told or encouraged to do so by teachers and also sometimes by parents to get into good universities. They are trained to perform well in entrance exams or other paper-based exams that has well-defined answers. They are trained not to make any mistakes. However, in a real science project, you have to be intellectually adventurous to try things that others don't do. Therefore, you may make mistakes, but after all, only by trying something different, you can find, you can make discoveries. So let me explain how I was made into scientists. To do so, I have to show this picture. The school system of Keio, Gijuku Keio School, which starts from elementary school all the way to graduate school. I got into Keio Elementary School at age six. And two science, there were two science teachers, both researchers. One already had PhD, the other actually received PhD after I graduated. They were always in school lab doing something for obviously research. I didn't know what, 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 what they were doing back then. But what was really impressive was that when we were 10, fourth grade, we were basically those teachers taught us the taxonomy of seashells, the study of how different kinds of seashells are categorized and named. And there was a huge display of seashell specimens in the science classroom, and each one of them had label with the discoverer's name on it. And it became my dream to, to place a seashell with my name on it. So we went, out, we went out to the field trip to Tatishina, seashell hunting trip. I was everywhere. 
of course, to find something, to find a new species specimen, I had to go places where others don't go. And then I, I you know, I looked for seashells everywhere, and then the moment came. I found a new one. I washed with the water, and I ran to the cabin where inspector, our teacher, wait, awaited. I ran to ran into the cabin. He knew that I found a new one, so I gave him this seashell proudly, and then he went speechless. After careful selections of some words, he said, Itokun, Kohei, I'm sorry. Someone else just found one about a moment ago. Already at age 10, I learned what was needed to be a scientist. I prepared, prepared myself well to make new discoveries. I actually experienced the excitement of discovery. But at the same time, I learned the, disappointed, the disappointment of reporting, being second in reporting it. When I moved up to Keio Futsub, the junior high school, there were many friends joining us or actually entering Keio high, junior high school through rigorous entrance exams on math, science, Japanese, and so on. And of course, you know, they were intellectually far superior than us. But we were supposedly more adventurous, and we were. So together we formed intellectually adventurous kids' society, which was needed, of course, to make scientific discovery. Math teacher in Keio Junior High School took us to Keio University's Information Science Laboratory when we were 14. We were suddenly in the middle of research environment with other KO University researchers and graduate students. Imagine the excitement of 14-year-olds being in, being part of the research environment with professional researchers. Although we, you know, our program was very primitive, we were just solving simple math problem, but we felt so cool. Same thing happened when we went, move on to KO High School. Of course, you know, Many more intellectual people joined us, but again, together we formed a society of intellectually adventurous group. And then there we learn about taxonomy of actually this time fossil. So a geoscience teacher was a fossil digger, and he again taught us fun of fossil research. So basically, Previous talks today actually show that KO school system values highly of creativity in art. And although KO try, it didn't work so well to me as you, as you saw in my drawing. But as you can as you can tell in my talk, I was definitely educated into science by the great KO educational system. Thank you.